Hi again, and welcome back to the Learn to Code Space Invaders course, and we're now on lesson number nine. In the previous lesson, we finished off getting the firing code working, so that we can now press the fire button and fire a bullet up to the top of the screen. In this lesson, instead of allowing just one bullet, we're going to allow the player to fire multiple bullets at a time. So we're going to have to look at some things called arrays, and we're going to have to look at using some looping structures in our code to handle those. So let's get started on making that update then. To see what we're trying to achieve in this lesson, let's have a look at the finished bit of code. So I have it running here, and you can see that we have our, our normal player ship along the bottom of the screen. And pressing the fire button does our normal firing action. But this time, if I move my ship across and press the fire button, you'll see that we can now have more than one missile coming out. And if you looked at that, you would have seen that we can have up to five missiles or bullets on the screen at a time. If there are five on the screen and I press the fire another time, it, it won't generate a sick that'll actually wait until the first missile has finished, and then it will allow me to fire another one. So in other words, um, I, I can only ever have a maximum of five bullets on the screen at a time. And each of these bullets then behaves independently of any of the other ones. So it starts off and it isn't affected by anything else I'm doing. It fires and then travels up to the top of the screen until it finishes. So each one is behaving as its own separate bullet object. And that's what we're going to have to try and build into our code now. So I'm coming back into tick 80 and I'm going to load our lesson eight code. So that's where we're gonna start from. And if we come in here, again, I'm gonna edit this so that we are now working on lesson number nine. We have our, our code as before. So we have our player ship object defined here. And we then have our player bullet object. So this block of code defines a single player bullet for us. So you might think that the easiest way then to get uh, five player bullets is to simply copy this block of code. So if we do control C and copy that, we can paste it in there and we can have player bullet number two. So we can have player bullet number one and player bullet number two. And we could keep on going until we have five player bullets. This simple way of looking at it, I hopefully you can see that that becomes very cumbersome. Again, we're, we're repeating this block of code out five times. But one of the important things is that we are having to give different variable names to each one. And that means that when we come down to doing our code, where we are checking for um, bullets being active, we will have to check for player bullet one active, player bullet two active, and so on and so on. And we'll have to type out each line of code separately. And the big problem then comes when we want to make any changes. So say we decide that actually five bullets is a bit too many. It makes the game a bit easy. So let's knock it down to three. We're going to have to come back in here, delete out our last two bullet player bullet variables, and then go through each block of code and, f and manually again delete out anywhere where it's referencing bullets uh, four and five. So this, this method of just simply duplicating our, our variables and giving them separate names is it, just simply not going to work. We need a way of, if I just take this stuff out here, we need a way of storing more than one player bullet so that we can easily change the number that's in this store but also then easily work our way through the different bullets, updating them and checking them if they're active or, or not active. So the way we're going to do this is using something called an array. And this is another sort of data structure. And we're actually going to be seeing that it's, it's going to be another way of using um, tables inside Lua.
But arrays then are a, one of the basic forms of, of variables that you use in programming to store multiple versions or, or multiple variables. So let's go and have a look at that in a bit more detail and see how that actually works. So we currently have a single player bullet variable and that's one of these objects that we have built. And we've just had a look now that simply creating three more of those, for instance, to have a total of four bullets in our system isn't going to work well for us. It just, it just becomes cumbersome and very awkward to work with. What we need is a special variable that can hold all four bullets in a way that makes it easy for us to access them. And this is where our array comes into play. So we can create a variable called player bullets, which is going to hold all of the bullets that our player can use. An array allows us to create numbered slots. And then each of these slots allow us to put in a variable. So in our example, we're going to create four numbered slots, slots one to four. Now, if you've been working with any other programming languages, you might have seen that quite often the numbers in arrays start at position zero. So they would go from zero to three. Um, but in, in Lua, it's more common to start at position one. So that's what we're going to do for this. Um, but don't worry about that. They're different languages. These are, these are the sort of minor differences that different languages end up having. So we've now created our slots one, two, three, and four. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by creating a bullet object. And then we're going to simply put that into slot number one. We're then going to create a new bullet object and put that into slot number two. And then to repeat the same process into slots number three and slots number four. So we then end up with our player bullets array containing four separate bullets, which is exactly what we wanted. But you might be thinking that we've ended up back where we started with simply four separate bullet objects. And in effect, that's what we do have. But by putting them inside an array, we gain a number of very useful advantages. The advantage which is going to help us in our current situation is the way in which we access these variables. When we looked at the simple copying and pasting idea, we saw that we had to give the variables different names, and those then had to be typed in manually into our code so that our code could access the different variables. In an array, we can use these slot numbers, which are called indexes, to access the various elements. So, if we have a look at how we would call these then, we can simply write player bullet, we then use square brackets, and we then have the index number inside the square brackets. So player bullet square bracket one would access the first element in our array. Similarly, we can then use the other index numbers to reference each of the other elements. So player bullet open brackets two, three and four. And that lets us get to all the elements of our array. And the important point here then is that to get to each element, we're simply using a nice ordered numeric value. And one of the things that computers are incredibly good at is working with numbers. So if we wanted to check all four bullets, what we'd need to do is to create a variable which we can get to count up from number one to number four. We can then access each of the individual elements in the array by using that notation. So player bullets, open square brackets, and then our variable name. And what that will do then is it will start off looking at player bullet one, then player bullets two, three, and four. This idea of counting up in numbers is something which we do a lot in our code. And we've got some special commands that cover this. So this is gonna be um, implemented using what's known as a for loop. So if I put in the actual code that generates that, 
we have the first line. So four bullet equals one to four do. We then have uh, the block of code that we want to keep repeating. And in our case, that will be setting up each of the bullets. And we then have the end of the for loop. And what happens here is that our for loop simply goes round and round. It repeats the block of code we have inside the for loop. But each time it repeats that block of code, our variable bullet will simply count up. So the first time we execute that block of code, bullet will equal one. Then the second time, two, three, and four. So in this way, it gives us a chance to access every single element of our array and check that bullet to move it, to see if it's hit the top of the screen, or to see if it's ready to be fired. So let's drop back into tick 80, and we'll have a little bit of a play with these arrays. So if you've been doing some work, make sure you save that. And then we're going to want to create a new um, program, so a new cart. And if we go in there, again, we get all of our standard um, code. So if we do Control A and delete that, we're now down to a totally blank bit of code. So let's drop in our script block, which says this is a Lua program. So we're now ready to start just playing about with these arrays. What we'll do first of all is we know that we need this tick function, otherwise tick 80 won't run. So let's just drop that in so we're all ready to go. So we've seen that arrays allow us to create um, a number of slots inside our array into which we can then put some information, our variables and so on. We've already been doing this um, with our object variables. So in, in our Lua, we've been creating objects using our Lua table syntax. Again, these are these curly braces. So I've created here an object, which is simply a Lua table. But inside that table, we can then create named boxes. And we were using them to store our uh, variables. And we could do something along the lines of that and other variable equals 20. So in effect, we have created a variable which we've said is going to be one of our objects. It is a Lua table. But inside the table, we've created two sub-objects. But in effect, what we've done is we've created a slot inside our table. We've given it the name variable, and we've put a number inside it. And again, that's how we built up our objects, by storing these um, named variables. Again, that's all a variable is. It's just a box with a name on it and something inside it. So we were able to build up our objects that described our player ships and player bullets and so on. But it really was just a table with some named slots inside it. And our array then is going to work in a very similar fashion. So we've already seen that arrays create slots, but then label them with numbers. So if we were to create an array, we could try doing it as the same way as we've done with our objects. So we're going to create a Lua table. And we're then going to simply say, I want this slot to be called number one. And I want to make that equal to, let's say, 20. So we're trying to do a very similar thing to we're doing up here, where we said, let's create a slot called variable and put the number 10 inside it. So we've created a slot called one and put the number 20 inside it. But if we try to run that using our control R to, R to run it, you'll see that we get an error coming up. And it's saying here that there's an error on line 13 and it expected um, uh, to, to close the, the braces at line, at line 11. And what that's really saying to us is that it, it came to this line 13 and it saw this number one. Uh, and number one isn't something you can have uh, as a label inside our table. That's, that's really what that error was saying. And if you look at it here, you, you can see that it's saying one equals 20. Um, that, that really doesn't make sense. 
So our array, we have to look at it in a slightly different way. And what we can do here is if we simply just put some values in, so we're not naming the slots, we're just putting values in here. We could say we could put in value one and value two. And what will happen is that our system will now create a table called array. So that will be our array. And it will automatically say, I've seen you trying to put a couple of values into this. So we've got two little strings coming in here. And it will automatically put the first one into a slot named number one and the second one into a slot named number two. And we could carry on putting in more and more in there. So let's see if we can actually get that to work. So down here, we know that we need to clear our screen and we're then going to print and let's say array, oh, the brackets in. So array, so the array is the name of our array table. We now need to use square brackets. So just beside your P key, you'll find a square bracket. And we then need to tell it what slot to use. So we know that the first slot is slot number one. And then our print statement, if we do comma zero, zero then we know that will print in the top uh, left hand corner of our screen. So what we're expecting here is we've created an array, we've put two string values inside that, value one and value two. The Lua, when it created our table, should have put this value one into slot one and value two into slot two. So down here, we've asked it to print out from our array variable, so our array table, whatever is in slot number one. So if we run that, you can see we get value one coming up in the top corner. And, and, and that's what we were expecting to have. <clears throat> so an array is simply using a table in, in a slightly different way and getting the system to automatically number our slots for us so that they go into a numerical order. If you've been looking at other programming language such as Python, you'll have seen that this similar idea occurs there as well. Um, Python uses, well, doesn't call anything an actual array. Um, it, it uses lists and tuples and sets and dictionaries. But all of those are just simply arrays, which we, we um, are called tables in Lua, it's just using our array or our table in a slightly different way. And the different way is in which it's, it's how we reference the slot in our array. So just to recap then, so in our objects, we are giving each slot an actual English name. So we're naming it as a variable. In an array, we're letting the system slot those ones in for us um, and give them numeric indexes. And that's really the only difference. So let's try writing a little program which will just further um, demonstrate this. So we're getting back to our, uh, our, our situation here. So let's create an array and we're gonna call our array fruits. So fruits is going to be an array, which we said is just another use of our Lua table. <clears throat> and we're gonna put a number of fruits in here. So I'm gonna put in an apple, an orange, uh, a grape, and a pear. So I've created an array. I've put four string values into it. So we should be getting apple being in slot number one, orange in slot number two, grape in slot number three, and pear in slot number four. <clears throat> so if I come down here, I should be able then to, again, I've changed the name of my variable. So if I say, what is the first fruit? We should get um, 
orange, sorry, apple. And if I then copy that and paste it in below here, and if we say fruit number slot two, and print that just a little bit lower down the screen. So we should then be able to print out the first two values that are being held in our array. And let's run that. Oh, and we have a little error here in line 16. So what have we done wrong? And again, I called it fruits, where actually it is a fruit down here. So fruits and fruits. Okay, so I should fix that. So if I run that, you can see we now have our apple and our orange, which are the first two values in our array. So we know now that our array is storing these values and storing them using these numeric indexes. And that's all, very, all well and good. And we've seen here that we can now just write this out and we can start accessing those by typing in our commands. But we know that in our code for our Space Invaders, we're going to want to access these using our software. So we, we won't necessarily know exactly how many of these values are going to be in there. Um, because we might be changing that. Uh, and if we write a bit of code that is written like this, it, it will be assuming that we'll be having, say we were had written it to, to handle five bullets, we'd be handling bullet one, bullet two, bullet three, bullet four, bullet five. But then when we come back and we change that to bullet three, so, sorry, uh, three bullets in our array, um, bullets four and bullets five just won't exist anymore and the software will give an error. So we want to be able to detect how many piece, or how many slots there are in our array. And again, th th this is one of the standard things that we are doing with arrays. So what we'll do is we will do a new print statement in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out how many slots our fruits variable has. And we do that using the hash symbol, which is um, that little sort of um, knots and crosses symbol. And if I do that, and if I print that at 0, 0, and then move these two down a bit so we can see everything. So our first line should print how many slots we have, or, or how many elements, so each slot is called an element in the array, so that will tell us how many elements are in our array, and then print out the first two elements as before. So if we run that, you can see that it's telling us now that we have four elements in our array. The first one is apple, the first one, sorry, the second one is orange. So let's go back into our code and do some more playing with this. So we've currently got just the first two being printed out. So let's complete this then and print out all, all the elements in the array. So, so far we've been looking at um, just simply copying this line and pasting it in. And we can then say, let's print out element three and element four, and that will be at position 24 and 32. And if we run that then, you'll see that we have all the elements in our array being printed out. But this is it, it's not giving us any real benefit here in that we're still having to type out everything. And if we then add a new fruit up here, so let's have a banana. If we do that and run our program, then obviously um, that banana doesn't get printed out. So although we have five elements in our array, we're only still only printing out the first four. So what we need to do is work out a way that we can automatically run through all the elements on, in our array, no matter how many there are. And so that if we do change that, our bit of code will detect that and just adjust itself and, and just keep on printing out everything for us. So if you think about it, all we've done here is we have started off looking at slot number one, slot number two, 
slot number three, slot number four. So we're really just counting up these slots until we get to what, however many slots were indicated by this value here. So remember this value tells us how many slots or how many elements are in the array or, or, or the length of the array it's sometimes called. So again, if, if you are coming from Python or, or some other type of programming language, um, instead of using a hash symbol, they will usually have a function which um, talks about the array length. Okay, so, so this is the length of our array here. So if we could get the computer to count up automatically, then obviously it could do that for us and we, and we could access all the elements. So let's see how we do that. So we're going to take that block out for now. So again, we did come across this in the little explanation on arrays. So we're going to use something called a for loop. So a for loop basically takes a variable. So I'm going to call it just counter because we're going to use this to count through the um, elements in our array. We then assign it a range of values. So in Lua, we can assign it using a couple of numbers. So if I say 1, 5, that will then give it a range between 1 and 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And we can then do something. And what we can do is we can do our print statement. So we can print from our fruits array, whatever element is in the slot numbered counter. So remember counter is going to go one, two, three, four, five. So this will be fruits one, fruits two. Each time we come round our loop, it will gradually count up. We can then print it. So our x value will be at the um, left hand side, so zero. But our y value then, again, we'll want that to count down as well. But if we think about it, we actually want to take it down in steps of eight. So if we do counter times eight, that will actually then start off. So when counter is one, it will print it at 0, 8. When counter is 2, it will be 0, 16 and all the way down. And again, we put that expression inside brackets, so we need to close this bracket. Okay, so, so that bracket and that bracket match up. This bracket we haven't closed yet, so let's put that in at the end here. And then we need to end our for loop. So we've now got our for loop. It's created a variable called counter. It's given it a range of values between one and five. And it's then going to print out whatever from our fruits array, whatever is an element um, labeled with that counter value um, and then moving it down the screen as well. So if we run that, we should then find that it will print out all five of our um, elements. But again, we've fixed it at five by putting that in here. So what we could do, of course, is instead of five, just tell it to use a range between one and then the total number of elements in the array, which again we've seen there is by this hash fruits. So if you run that now, we should get exactly the same thing. But as we start to add more values in here, um, so raspberry and a lime, and, and we could go whatever we want in there. But if we run that now, you can see that it is telling us we now have seven elements in our array, but our for loop because it is detecting how many elements it needs to count up to, it's always printing them all out. So we've learnt about arrays and how they work. We've seen now how we can create an array and put data inside it. And we've also seen how we can use a for loop to step through each element in the array 
accessing each one and in this particular instance printing them out onto screen. So that's going to be enough for this lesson. In the next lesson we're going to look at how we can load data automatically into the array and you're going to have a go at programming your own array, initialization and printing yourselves. So make sure you save the work we currently have, so save that as lesson number nine, and I'll see you in the second part of this lesson. Bye for now. Don't forget to visit the course pages for this project. There you'll be able to download the code for this lesson and get lots of extra hints and tips. You'll also get access to all my other programming, electronics and gaming projects. All the links are in the description below. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.